Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. The book I am interpreting for you in this issue is a classic literary masterpiece, Pride and Prejudice, which is at least among the top five in terms of popularity and appeal in the world literature series. The author of this book, Jane Austen, is one of the most important novelists of the late 18th century in Britain, and her distinctive personal style is unparalleled. To describe the significance of this book, and its author in the world, especially in Britain, one only needs to open the wallets of the British people. The new version of the £10 banknote features the portrait of Jane Austen, putting her on equal footing with the British Queen. In contrast to this, most people only vaguely know that this novel tells a love story, but it is not like the Romeo and Juliet type. Like Austen's other works, Pride and Prejudice lacks intense and dramatic plots of undying love. Instead, it focuses on balls, card games, visiting, and endless conversations, with the ending always being a happy reunion. Making sense of the intricate details within these trivialities is not an easy task, and understanding why this novel has remained enduring through these mundane details is even more difficult. Pride and Prejudice was published in 1796. To enter a story that took place over 200 years ago, you first need to have a rough understanding of the time and space. Britain was in the Regency era, which can also be seen as a transitional period from the reign of King George to the famous Victorian era. What was the basic landscape of this era like? The enclosure movement in the countryside had already gone through several rounds, and the enterprise of opening new sea routes was flourishing. The Industrial Revolution had begun but was far from reaching its peak. It would still take another 30 years before steam engines were put on railways. Therefore, as you can see, all modes of transportation in pride and prejudice rely on horses and carriages. The activities and travel plans of the ladies are constrained by the speed of horses and the arrangement of carriages. Austin is very precise in these matters to the point that after reading the novel, you can almost sketch out the map of those counties and villages in your mind and mark the travel time between them. You can also discover that Austin is skilled at utilizing this precise concept of time to drive the key plot points of the novel. In short, during the time of Pride and Prejudice, Britain was on an upward trajectory politically, economically, and technologically, and the most glorious period of the British Empire, the Sun Never Sets era, was about to come. Various emerging modes of production were giving rise to corresponding laws and regulations, ethical standards, hierarchical systems, interpersonal relationships, and cultural connotations. Urbanization had not yet entered an accelerated expansion phase, but whether in the city or the countryside, the middle class was becoming a stable and influential force. Priests, merchants, lawyers, and country gentlemen, people without noble titles but holding new money, were increasingly making a significant impact on social and economic life. After creating considerable wealth, they naturally desired corresponding improvements in their political status. In today's terms, this is called a period of social transition. Observing the nuances of human interactions and the changes in fashion during a period of societal transformation is a compelling reason for a novelist to have the desire to write. However, when it comes to Jane Austen and her pride and prejudice, we must consider the relatively unique literary context of that time. In Britain at that time, the genre of novel was still in its adolescence. Although authors like Swift, Defoe, and Fielding had paved the way, novels had not yet reached the realm of high literature and still held a relatively lower position within the literary ecosystem. Later generations generally refer to that period as the Romantic Era, but the prominent figures at that time were mostly poets like Wordsworth. Male writers and readers with more dignity and aspirations often felt reluctant to mix in this domain, which led to a unique phenomenon. Women read novels, and women wrote novels. At this point, you can imagine the environment in which Miss Austen began conceptualizing her novels. She grew up in a respectable parsonage family in the south of England, ranking sixth among her siblings. Like the standard middle-class configuration at the time, the children of the Austen family, including the females, received a good education, and they had ample opportunities for reading during their upbringing. Miss Austen also went through the customary process of courtship and marriage. 
It is said that she had a love affair with an Irish lawyer, both families being of moderate means. However, both sets of parents had higher expectations for the return on investment in this marriage, and thus the marriage did not materialize. At that time, men in society held a monopoly in the job market and enjoyed an absolute advantage in the marriage market. Therefore, the Irish lawyer quickly forgot about this episode, continued working hard, and married another family's wealthy daughter. Our Miss Austin was delayed for a lifetime, but for literary history, it turned out to be a good thing. The time that should have been spent on household chores and child-rearing was used by her to read, observe, and write. What to write was a big question. The most popular novels of Austen's era tended to be melodramatic. Miss Austen must have come across haunted castles in many gothic novels or encountered the stereotypical image of fragile women in sentimental novels who were always teary-eyed and fainting at the slightest provocation. Did everyday life conceal a more complex sense of drama? Could this drama be more interesting than ancient tombs and legendary stories? Miss Austen may have pondered over such questions under the dim candlelight many times. In fact, when Austen decided to break away from the usual tropes and write something different, she truly changed literary history. Critics later discovered that without her innovative approach, that period would not have produced a respectable name or a significant work that could serve as a bridge between past and future. Miss Austen, the old maid hidden away in the drawing room, is an intriguing case, quite different from the later dazzling stars of the 19th century. All of Austen's works were published anonymously, and her literary reputation came from retrospective recognition several decades or even centuries later. She almost single-handedly and quietly filled that void. Part 1. Rather than what to write, how to write is a bigger question. Let's follow Austen's rhythm and see how this story is structured and unfolds. In a small village in the south of England, there is a country gentleman's family named Bennett. Mr. Bennett and his wife have five unmarried daughters. As the story begins, Mrs. Bennett excitedly informs Mr. Bennett that Netherfield Park, a nearby estate, has finally been rented out to a wealthy young bachelor from the north of England named Mr. Bingley, emphasis on the fact that Mr. Bingley is single. Mrs. Bennett is thrilled, and Mr. Bennett, though secretly excited, maintains a calm demeanor. However, he secretly visits the neighboring house to gather information and reports back to his wife, instructing her to patiently wait for Mr. Bingley's return visit. To understand what this couple is up to and why they are so excited and invested, we first need to understand one thing, the inheritance laws of 18th century Britain. From today's perspective, these laws are quite peculiar, complex, and often defy common sense, resulting in numerous disputes characteristic of the transitional historical period. Why do I say this? Let's delve into the details. 18th century Britain employed a complex system of inheritance, with different rules for movable and immovable property. Movable property was relatively straightforward, usually divided into three shares, one for the wife, one for the children, and one for the church. According to this rule, if Mr. Bennett were to pass away, Mrs. Bennett and her five daughters would share a total of £5,000 from the movable property and Mrs. Bennett also brought with her a dowry of £4,000 from her own family. However, like today, the main wealth of families was in immovable property, such as land. The Bennett family's life was only decent because they had an estate that generated a stable income of £2,000 per year. However, this money could only be received until Mr. Bennett's death because at the time, British land inheritance followed the medieval feudal tradition of primogeniture where the eldest son inherited as the primary principal. The advantages of primogeniture were the preservation of land and property integrity, facilitating government administration, and assigning the responsibility of supporting other family members to the eldest son. However, this seemingly convenient solution from the government's perspective often encountered problems in practice. For example, Mrs. Bennett, who kept giving birth until after the fifth daughter, suddenly realized that there was no eldest son to inherit the immovable property. She had never worried about this in her early years, living without frugality, but now she was anxiously concerned about it day and night. Even more distressing than primogeniture was the concept of entailment. Land ownership in Britain was complex, 
with many estates carrying ancient feudal obligations that dated back over a thousand years to the Norman dynasty. These obligations were intricate, and in simple terms, meant that the land belonged to the king, and it was passed down through successive layers of subinfeudation. However, one couldn't simply inherit the land without fulfilling certain obligations, such as providing military service, which was the case with the Bennett family's estate as depicted in the novel. Although the practice of sending male members to serve in the military had long been abolished, the system of entailment that resulted from it remained intact. Entailed properties could not remain vacant. There had to be a male heir in formal service. If there were no male members in the family, then, sorry, the relevant authorities would appoint a male heir based on kinship. Mr. Bennett could only console Mrs. Bennett by saying, take it one day at a time. Maybe you'll have the good fortune of dying before me. Because the Bennett family had no sons, Mrs. Bennett and her daughters would be unable to inherit properties like the estate. If Mrs. Bennett happened to outlive Mr. Bennett, his distant cousin, Mr. Collins, could evict her and the five daughters at any time. This unfair inheritance law persisted for many years, causing frustration and discontent among numerous Mrs. Bennetts and leading to ethical scandals. It was not until 1925 that the law was completely abolished. Hence, in the first episode of the British drama Downton Abbey, set in the early 20th century, we can see that even aristocratic estates of that time faced the same issue as depicted in Pride and Prejudice, the absence of a male heir who could only pass on the family estate to a distant cousin, causing chaos and upheaval. It's safe to say that from Pride and Prejudice to Downton Abbey, this bone lodged in the throats of the British lasted for over a hundred years without respite. After explaining all this, it's important to note that Mrs. Bennet, although not the most likable character, is genuinely anxious and her concerns are understandable. In that era, women didn't have careers, and marriage was not only a matter of utmost importance but, in Austin's words, the sole object that determined livelihood and even survival. For young ladies, seeking love and going through social means such as courtship and arranged meetings was equivalent to contemporary women bundling the college entrance exam, job hunting, and love marriage together, a one-shot deal with little chance for a comeback. Such a fate was quite bleak, and the battles within were undoubtedly intense. However, Austin didn't intend to write in a bleak or intense manner. She preferred to treat the entire situation as a comedy. So, from the very beginning, she steadfastly laid the foundation of the novel with a comedic tone. With the comedic tone set, the Bennett family welcomes Mr. Bingley's visit, the wealthy bachelor mentioned at the beginning of the story. Even such a small detail can be filled with twists and turns thanks to the elasticity of comedy. Mr. Bingley simply delays his visit by a few days, claiming that he needs to make a trip to the city. Mrs. Bennett assumes that things are going downhill, and becomes anxious. Later, she hears that Mr. Bingley values the visit greatly and has brought seven men and twelve women with him from the city. Instead of feeling relieved upon hearing about the female guests, the Bennett family becomes even more worried, fearing that these men will bring their families and ruin their hopes. In the end, the truth is revealed that only six female guests arrived, all of whom are Mr. Bingley's sisters and cousins. Everyone breathes a sigh of relief. These seemingly casual details quietly raise your expectations. Experienced readers know that the real show is about to begin. The curtains rise, and the main characters make their entrances at the ball. Mr. Bingley is a handsome and wealthy man, but his introduction seems to serve as a reference point for the readers because the man accompanying him is even more handsome, wealthier, and exudes a particularly strong presence. Rumor has it that this fifth in line for a title has an annual income of £10,000. This diamond in the rough is Mr. Darcy, the male protagonist of the novel, and with just a couple of paragraphs, you can already determine that the label of pride in the book's title applies to him. Darcy, with a strong sense of social class, clearly finds the overly enthusiastic behavior and lack of refinement of the Bennett family distasteful. At the ball, Mr. Bingley quickly sets his sights on the eldest Bennett daughter, Jane. Jane's beauty, propriety, and somewhat dull kindness make her the female version of Mr. Bingley. In contrast, there's Elizabeth Bennett, the second eldest daughter and the novel's female protagonist. She is lively and sensitive, 
and Darcy's arrogance activates her sense of self-worth, laying the foundation for Elizabeth's subsequent prejudice. The pattern of opposites attracting is revealed at their first encounter. As time passes, the two families become acquainted. However, Mrs. Bennett has no idea how to overcome the social barriers and secure this match, especially when it comes to dealing with Mr. Bingley's snobbish and pretentious sisters. With her limited vision and intelligence, she can only scheme a little. So, when Netherfield Park sends an invitation to Jane, the eldest Bennett daughter, Mrs. Bennett firmly decides not to let her go in a carriage. Because the weather is predicted to rain, Jane can only have a chance of staying overnight at Mr. Bingley's house if she rides alone on horseback, allowing her to spend more time with Mr. Bingley. We have to admire Mrs. Bennett's meticulous thinking. She even considers that at the time, Netherfield's carriage is likely being used for other purposes and won't be able to bring Jane back promptly. Before Jane leaves, Mrs. Bennett wishes her bad weather, ironically hoping for it to rain. As a result, this plan proved successful and exceeded Mrs. Bennett's expectations. Not only did Jane stay overnight, but she also fell ill from riding in the rain. Elizabeth, worried about her sister, who couldn't ride, walked three miles to Netherfield Park to visit her. Along the way, she got money, and they both ended up staying there for more than one night. Through this illness, the young men and women had the opportunity to be in close proximity, observing and colliding with each other, fully displaying their personalities to the readers. The most disappointed seemed to be Miss Bingley, Mr. Bingley's sister, who neither wanted to see the lowly-born Jane become her sister-in-law nor witness her admired Mr. Darcy's growing friendship with Elizabeth through their witty exchanges. However, both of these developments seemed to be going against her wishes. How Miss Bingley would retaliate was a suspenseful question planted in the story. Part 2 Usually, when a story is going smoothly, it is necessary to introduce some disruptions, and the author has the responsibility to arrange the troublemakers in a timely manner. In this novel, there are two such characters. The first is Mr. Collins, a caricature-like character and Mr. Bennett's cousin. As mentioned earlier, Mr. Collins stands to inherit the most if Mr. Bennett were to pass away. Mr. Collins recently obtained the patronage of Lady Catherine de Bourg, a noble widow, and secured a position as a clergyman. Feeling triumphant, he believed that the only missing piece in his blueprint for a successful life was to marry one of the Bennett daughters. Mrs. Bennett pointed out that Jane was already spoken for, so Mr. Collins settled for Elizabeth as his target. Mr. Collins can be considered a parodical figure, imitating the affected mannerisms of the upper class when speaking and writing, but quickly revealing an ignorant and shameless bourgeois appearance. When proposing to Elizabeth, his trump card was to calculate her financial worth. He stated that her rightful inheritance amounted to only £1,000 in savings, with an annual interest of 4%, which she would only receive after Mrs. Bennett's death. Given these circumstances, Mr. Collins, with his current social standing, proposed humbly to her, leaving no room for negotiation. The second troublemaker is Captain Wickham, a militia officer stationed nearby, who is the most attractive male character in the novel. Besides his looks, his charm to win over Elizabeth lies in disclosing his own background. Through his narrative, Wickham easily draws Elizabeth into a classic and heart-wrenching storytelling trope a steward's son with no support or protection, bullied by a wealthy gentleman, deprived of the clergy position and one thousand pounds inheritance that should have secured his future, and forced to join the military. In this story, Wickham is the pitiable male lead, and the arrogant Mr. Darcy is the wealthy gentleman, who happens to be the nephew of Lady Catherine de Bourg, Mr. Collins's patron. According to Wickham, Darcy is likely to marry his cousin, Miss de Bourg, and combine their fortunes. Although the novel does not explicitly state whether the clergy position Wickham lost is the same one Collins acquired, when these two characters, the unfortunate officer Wickham and the bully Darcy, simultaneously present themselves before Elizabeth, we can imagine the stark contrast she perceives. This is the magic of a clever novelist, through the arrangement and combination of time, place, and character relationships, within a limited span of pages, they provide ample room for the development of events and the emotional ups and downs of the characters. 
The transitional period calls for more progressive thinking among the middle class, as they seek to redefine the institution of marriage and find a balance between money and emotions. Elizabeth represents this class of individuals, and she decisively rejects Collins's proposal, delivering a resounding declaration. I am not romantic, you know. I never was. I ask only a comfortable home, and considering Mr. Collins's character, connection, and situation in life, I am convinced that my chance of happiness with him is as fair as most people can boast on entering the marriage state. However, at the same time, she wholeheartedly believes Wickham's story. To some extent, it is precisely because she has just declared her value for emotions to Collins that she seeks to reinforce this belief through sympathy and trust in Wickham. At this moment, Elizabeth, rather than falling in love with Wickham, can be said to have fallen in love with herself, a person who can think independently and is not swayed by money. Austin's insightful understanding of human nature is evident here. This pivotal and thrilling section spans about fifteen chapters where events unfold rapidly and conflicts between characters intensify. Due to a series of misunderstandings, Elizabeth forms a deep-seated prejudice against Darcy's arrogance. For the entire novel, this section serves as a powerful junction, solidifying the groundwork laid in the preceding chapters and paving the way for subsequent developments. We soon witness Mr. Collins, Mr. Bennett's cousin, being rejected by Elizabeth and turning his attention to her friend, Miss Lucas, who is far less attractive and intelligent. The two quickly become engaged. At the same time, after Mr. Bingley and his wealthy party leave for London, Jane loses direct contact with him. She attempts to visit him in London but is met with various excuses from Bingley's sisters. Elizabeth attributes the blame for this turn of events solely to Darcy, to the point that when Darcy finally puts his pride aside and expresses his love for her, she passionately refuses him. Mrs. Bennet, who thought she would soon secure two good marriages, finds her hopes shattered in an instant. What she cannot openly express is that the Lucas family, the family to whom Collins turned for a proposal after being rejected by Elizabeth, although socially acquainted with them, cannot help but compare themselves privately. Sir William Lucas, head of the Lucas family, holds a knighthood and has considered himself superior since having an audience with the royal family in his early years. Yet, he focuses solely on socializing and neglects his business, resulting in a more financially precarious situation than the Bennett family. Miss Lucas quickly ensnares Collins after being rejected by Elizabeth, claiming that she only does so to secure a reliable storeroom for herself. It is evident that this storeroom refers to the Bennett family's property that Collins is set to inherit. With this exchange, the power dynamics between the Lucas and Bennett families naturally shift. As a result, the Lucas family begins calculating how much longer Mr. Bennett may live, as acquiring the Bennett family's property would greatly increase their chances of having another audience with the royal family. Austin delicately presents this detail, but its underlying implications are highly ironic. The impoverished aristocracy resorts to scheming in order to maintain their empty titles by seizing the new money they despise. As the Bennett family reaches its lowest point, the novel takes a dramatic turn as is often the case in comedic narratives. Previously scattered plot lines are skillfully woven back together. First, Darcy, after being rejected by Elizabeth, reflects deeply on his own prideful mindset. He realizes that in the past, he measured the value of things based on social standing and refinement, unwilling to empathize with others and dismissive of explanations and clarifications. This approach was both arbitrary and shallow and it seemed inadequate to keep up with the times. Consequently, he writes a letter to Elizabeth, clarifying the false accusations made by Captain Wickham. No one deprived Wickham of his property and position. It was Wickham's own reckless behavior, extravagance, and even his attempt to seduce Darcy's sister that led to his dismissal. Wickham quickly proves Darcy's honesty through his actions, but this time the victim is Elizabeth's sister, Lydia. Wickham seduces Lydia and they elope, causing a sensation. It is well known that Wickham neither possesses the means to marry nor intends to change his flirtatious ways. If Lydia is abandoned, the Bennett family's reputation will be disgraced, and all five daughters will face the prospect of being unable to marry. Mrs. Bennett laments, 
Mr. Bennett can only seize silently, and Darcy takes immediate action. Darcy finds Wickham, arranges employment for him, and forces him to promise to marry Lydia. He even provides a substantial sum of money, with the condition that they keep the matter secret and credit Elizabeth's uncle for their rescue. It is easy to imagine how rapidly Elizabeth's feelings of affection for Darcy escalate when she inadvertently discovers his noble act. How willingly she accepts his second proposal. In that moment, Elizabeth makes a significant adjustment to her prejudice. She finally sees that the word arrogance can also radiate its own brilliance because Darcy has defended the honor of an aristocrat through his actions. Although the information provided in the book suggests that Darcy is not a traditional hereditary nobleman, he resembles a well-established, affluent member of the landed gentry. The story reaches this point, where all obstacles and misunderstandings on the path of marriage are resolved. Mr. Bingley and Jane reunite after a long separation, while Miss Bingley and Miss de Borg suffer a crushing defeat in their battle for Darcy against Elizabeth. Lady Catherine even privately threatens Elizabeth out of frustration, but her only role is to add fuel to the already blazing love. The final scenes recount a series of joyful events, as the mentioned couples all enter into matrimony, although the future quality of these marriages may vary. Part 3 Just now, we have reviewed the main plot of Pride and Prejudice, and it is not difficult to see that the author has meticulously designed the structure. The words and actions of the main characters are interwoven, mutually referencing and advancing the plot, maintaining a steady pace throughout the story. Moreover, these elements are integrated into everyday conversations and outings, where all the crucial scenes that determine the characters' fate appear in their ordinary form, fitting naturally. Austen never resorts to sensationalism like some of her contemporaries. Considering that novel writing techniques during that era were essentially a result of writers' self-cultivation, Without literary theories or creative writing classes, we cannot help but admire Austen's self-awareness of structure and her innate sense of proportion. It is truly remarkable. Even more remarkable is how this sense of proportion is concentrated in Austen's grasp of the themes. To this day, when studying Austen's values, it remains challenging to categorize her within any ready-made system. Experts in economic history can glean valuable primary material from her details, and feminists can measure the temperature and vitality of 18th-century female consciousness through an analysis of Elizabeth's thoughts. However, no ideology can confidently claim that Austen is firmly on their side. Under Austen's pen, we find the sharpest and most profound social criticism, but we also notice that she confines her characters to a very small circle as if the servants of the gentry families never fall within her field of vision. She encourages individual worth and advocates spiritual freedom, but with an almost equal determination, she disapproves of elopement, questions reckless romance, and emphasizes that love without economic foundation leads nowhere. Her sensitivity to social and economic conditions makes it difficult to find another author in literary history more suitable to have their face imprinted on currency. She derides the upper class with sarcasm, doesn't spare the occasional immaturity and self-conscious traps of the emerging middle class, and never misses an opportunity to crack a joke. However, at the same time, she holds a rather positive attitude towards the basic guarantee of social welfare and the possibility of reasonable personal happiness. She is a discerning critic but never an overt rebel. If someone else were to attempt to unify these conflicting elements, they would likely falter and ultimately create a text with a split personality. But Austen does not. With her pen, that playful tone, that half-truth, half-jest, she reminds you to view everything dialectically, reminding you that when you look at the obverse of a coin, you must always consider its reverse. After Austen, we can see this pragmatic balance based on empiricism in many British writers. This characteristic is deeply ingrained in the genetic makeup of British culture. It is difficult to say whether Austen is the pioneer of this tradition, but she is certainly an undeniable representative figure. If we attempt to understand British literature and the national character of the British people, then Austen and her pride and prejudice serve as a useful mirror. Even if it is driven by utilitarian motives, wanting to learn a bit of worldly philosophy, pride and prejudice holds more practical value than most classics. 
The ability to see beyond appearances and social relationships can be transferred to the workplace. Of course, it is most likely to resonate directly with modern individuals, especially modern women, in their approach to love and marriage. The plot of pride and prejudice can easily be simplified into the pattern of overbearing CEO falls in love with me, but such simplification does great injustice to Austin's keen insight into human affairs and understanding of human nature. 200 years later, it may seem that we are much more enlightened and liberated than in Austin's time. But can we confidently say that today's women have escaped the pressures faced by Elizabeth and Jane in the marriage market? In other words, when confronted with characters like Mr. Collins, who arrogantly present a seemingly comfortable storehouse to you, do you have the courage and insight to confidently say no? If you still have doubts about this, rereading Pride and Prejudice would be a meaningful endeavor. In conclusion, let's recap the key points discussed today. Firstly, Jane Austen lived during a transitional period in British literary history. Almost silently and single-handedly, she filled a gap and became one of the most important novelists of the late 18th century, with a unique and distinctive style. Secondly, Pride and Prejudice is Austen's most renowned work and one of the most widely recognized and celebrated novels worldwide. Through the story of the Bennett family's quest for suitable suitors for their daughters, it reflects the intricacies of social interactions and changing societal norms during a period of societal transformation. Thirdly, Austen's keen sensitivity to social and economic conditions is deeply reflected in her works. Through the everyday lives and conversations of her characters, we gain insights into historical and cultural knowledge such as the rise of the middle class and the evolving system of land inheritance in England. Fourthly, Austin exhibits exceptional control over structure and pacing, making significant contributions to the development of novelistic techniques. Moreover, her works have had a profound impact on values and beliefs. She explores how individuals, especially women, seek a balance between emotions and rationality, freedom and societal norms, offering her unique philosophical perspectives. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.